My name is Steven Pinker. I am a professor of psychology at Harvard University, and I am happy to speak with you today about human progress. Uh, humans love to witness violence. You can see it in our entertainment. People pay money to watch some people kill other people. We see that in Shakespeare, we see that in the Bible, we see that in uh, mafia movies, in war movies, in spy movies, uh, we, in Greek tragedies. We just love to get information about violence, probably because in our evolutionary history, there was always a risk of violence, even if the risk was very low, if it took place, it could be catastrophic, you could be killed. People who were always aware of how violence can occur, how you can defend yourself, how you can attack back, probably had an advantage, and I suspect that the human brain is wired to be interested in violence. Now that uh, leads to a big industry of entertainment, Many people uh, ask the question, are humans basically violent or are they basically peaceful and cooperative? I think that's the wrong question. You just look over human history and you see we are certainly capable of violence. There are wars and there are rapes and there are murders and there are riots. There's terrorism. On the other hand, uh, most of the time, most of us are not violent. And if you plot rates of violence over time, they tend to go down. So we are not uh, fixed at a certain constant level of violence. I think that the human brain is very complex. It has both motives toward violence and motives toward nonviolence or peace or cooperation. On the one side, the violent motives include uh, just pure exploitation. You want someone's land, you uh, murder them so you take the land or you drive them off the land just because you want it and you don't care about their welfare. Uh, or you kill them to steal their, their property or their women. Uh, there's dominance. Sometimes uh, people just want to be uh, superior to other people. They want to have power, they want to have rank, they want to have uh, fame. There's revenge. If one person harms another, that the victim feels that he has a right to retaliate and get revenge. There are violent ideologies, like uh, communism, that say that there has to be a constant revolution so that the working class can defeat the bourgeoisie and the uh, aristocracy. Uh, on the other hand, there are also parts of the brain that uh, pull us back from violence. What Abraham Lincoln, the American president, called the better angels of our nature, uh, a poetic metaphor for the parts of our nature that make us less violent. There's empathy. We can uh, f be concerned about the happiness of other people and be upset by their suffering. There's self-control. We can, might feel an urge to uh, attack or to retaliate, but then we also have the ability to hold back and uh, wait and think about it. There is uh, uh, just reason and knowledge. We can think of violence as a problem to be solved and say there's too much crime, there's too much war. Let's uh, be like inventors and figure out a way to reduce rates of uh, violence. There's a, a moral sense. There are just some things that a decent person just doesn't do, and maybe committing violence can be one of those. And so human history is always a balance between our, you can call them our inner devils or our inner demons on the one hand, and our better angels on the other. How, how do we control violence? One influential theory comes from the English philosopher Thomas Hobbes, who lived in the 1600s, who proposed that when there's a state of anarchy, there's always a danger of violence. Not necessarily because we're vicious animals, but simply because of fear. If I'm worried that my neighbor might attack, I might want to attack the neighbor before he attacks me. And then my neighbor can think the same thing. And each 
of two parties can worry about the other one attacking and be tempted to attack the other one uh, first. Or there can be uh, a, a desire for uh, revenge, that if there is some threat, some insult, uh, to show that you are not weak, that you can't be attacked, you might have to prove that you are tough and strong by retaliating against any insult or any threat. So it's very, very easy for violence to break out, even if people are not inherently violent. Now, you might think, okay, well, that means that uh, violence will always cancel each other, uh, cancel itself out. One violent act, one act of revenge, everyone's even. That's not the way it works, because the human mind also has biases that favor the self. If uh, I attack you, it is justified, it is justice, it is my legitimate revenge. If you attack me, it is outright aggression, it is outrageous. Now, if you have both sides thinking the same thing, then one act can lead to another, which leads to a third, which leads to a fourth, and you can get cycles of violence, which can result in, uh, in, in wars. Uh, that's often the cause of wars. How do you stop that? Hobbes proposed what he called le a leviathan. Took the name from the Bible, it refers to a sea monster. But it was a metaphor for a government, a king, a parliament that would uh, prevent people from attacking each other if the government made it uh, illegal, a crime, to uh, attack, then not only would each person, each gang, each province uh, not want to attack because the Leviathan would punish them, but they also would realize their neighbors aren't going to attack because their neighbors would be punished by the Leviathan. And so that is why Hobbes predicted that it, by the establishment of a government, you would have lower levels of, of, of uh, violent crime and civil war. In fact, in any part of the world that lives in a state of anarchy, there will be uh, attacks and raids and then revenge and vendettas and blood feuds and cycles of violence. We have data in Europe that go back uh, more than 800 years to the Middle Ages where the homicide rate was about 25 per, or 35 per 100,000 per year. Now it is less than one per 100,000 per year in Western European countries and the code of revenge is replaced by the rule of law and a court system and police and a system of justice. Uh, now, and one could even say that globally uh, there is, we don't really have a Leviathan, we have the United Nations, uh, and that is the next best thing. We don't want, probably don't want one world government, a global Leviathan, but agreements like treaties, regional organizations like Southeast Asian Treaty Organization, the European Union, the African Union, are all ways of having kind of a, a smaller Leviathan, but still bigger than one country. Now, what Hobbes uh, neglected is uh, the problem that even if a Leviathan keeps people from attacking each other, what prevents the Leviathan from attacking the people? And there's a danger that government will repress people uh, so that they are as badly off as if they attacked each other. Now, one can see democracy as trying to solve the problem of the violence of anarchy, which Hobbes wrote about, people attacking each other, versus the violence of tyranny, the government brutalizing its people, such as in North Korea uh, and other autocracies. Government control to keep people safe under the control of the people, um, but uh, the government itself being prevented from brutalizing its own citizens. Uh, if people, if nations feel safe next to their neighbors, they think, why waste all that money on armies and weapons? Uh, if I'm uh, already safe, then uh, I can reallocate money toward uh, the environment, toward uh, people's affluence. Uh, then 
their neighbor can think, well, that's one less thing for me to worry about, so I can spend less on defense as well. And you can have a uh, virtuous circle where regions of the world can become less violent. An example is Europe. Uh, Europe used to be the bloodiest place on Earth. Uh, there were constant wars. But since the end of World War II, there have been no wars in Western Europe and very, very few wars even in Eastern Europe since the fall of the Berlin Wall, the end of the uh, Soviet Empire, all forms of war and political violence have gone down in Europe. Likewise, in, uh, in North America, Canada and the United States used to fight wars. Now they no longer do. South America just ended the last war in the Western Hemisphere when the government of Colombia signed a treaty with the communist guerrillas, the FARC movement, F-A-R-C. That ended the last war in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, likewise, in, in uh, East Asia, you know, of course, Korea is one of the, uh, a part of the world that has the potential to be very, very dangerous. But still, no uh, major war since 1953. Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, the subject of war after war and has been fairly uh, peaceful. So it can happen that parts, regions of the world uh, can <clears throat> build on the, their peace and become more and more peaceful. Peace is not particularly natural. Uh, safety and order, uh, there are always people who will be tempted to exploit others. There will always be the tendency to retaliate and seek revenge. For peace to be possible, we have to have systems in place that make it uh, more advantageous to live in cooperation than to exploit. We have to have trade and exchange. Uh, you don't kill your customers, you don't kill your debtors. Uh, if it's cheaper to buy things than to steal them, then countries and people will be more likely to, to buy them and will refrain from violence. Likewise, if there is a, a set of rules, if there is a uh, neutral third party, a referee, an umpire, a judge, a, a court system, then people don't have to defend their interests by being uh, tough and violent, but they can uh, allow their disputes to be settled by objective, neutral third parties. Uh, there are, if we understand each other, if we develop our sense of empathy, so we know that the other person, the enemy, they are human beings like us. They can feel pleasure, they can feel pain, they love their children, they want to be safe. To the extent we can put ourselves in other people's position, then that enhances our desire to treat them fairly and makes it harder to exploit them. There are a number of different routes to peace and uh, cooperation, and we have to arrange our our laws, our society, our norms, our philosophy, our religion to make peace more desirable and more possible. Yeah, so progress cannot depend on changing human nature. Human nature changes in evolutionary time, which has a speed limit measured in generations. Then over thousands of years, the species changes. That's not something that we uh, want to engineer ourselves. It's not something we can engineer ourselves. That's not where the solution is going to come from. Instead, it's from our institutions, our knowledge, our norms, our laws, which try to give more power to the beneficial parts of human nature, the better angels of our nature, as Abraham Lincoln called them, and try to marginalize the more destructive parts of human nature. Those are institutions like democratic government, like the rule of law, like science, like uh, international institutions, like treaties, like rules and norms of behavior among decent people. All of those allow us to repress 
the uh, inner demons, the destructive parts of human nature, and to allow our better angels to predominate.